So good afternoon, everyone. And thank you all for joining this Housing Communities Research Group and CASM seminar. <clears throat> my name is Halima Sakrani. I'll be chairing today's session. So it's my pleasure to welcome as well today's speaker, David Christie. David's presenting today's seminar on new labor and street homelessness policy and posing the question if the policy was a forgotten triumph or a failed experiment. David is a doctoral researcher at the University of Birmingham in the History Department. So as we'll hear soon, um, David's research involves using oral history testimonies, trying to understand the motives the methods, the efficacy and the consequences of labor's intervention in street homelessness. David recently completed his MA. Uh, he was looking at the squatting movement in the 1970s. Prior to this, he spent uh, 10 years running projects for rough sleepers in London and Bristol. So he's got some frontline experience as well. And more recently, he's founded and chairs the Pandemic Perspectives, which is an interdisciplinary group uh, debating, as the name suggests, the impacts of the COVID pandemic. Um, enough from me now. Uh, I will hand over to David, who's going to do the screen share um, and look forward to hearing from David now. Oh, well, hello, and, and thanks very much for having me. Uh, um, uh, the title, as you can see, New Labour Street Homeless, Forgotten Triumph of Social Policy or Failed Experiment. Uh, now, I have to say, it's not the title of my research itself, but I think it frames the central question that I'm asking. Um, I have to say, I'm thoroughly intimidated uh, by the, uh, uh, the uh, knowledge and experience of the attendees. So I'd like to point out, this is a work in progress. I'm in the second year of my doctorate. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to the, the Q&A, uh, um, you know, um, your advice, your suggestions, your, your, your questions will be really appreciated. Uh, I think I also ought to say that, that uh, you know, I'm a historian, so there are aspects of this presentation that relate to as much to history as they do to social policy. Uh, but as you're all aware, um, governments are notoriously have, uh, you know, poor institutional memory. Uh, and, and I strongly believe that knowledge of, uh, of past policies and programs um, uh, have a direct relevance to contemporary social policy. Um, okay, um, I, I need to talk a little bit about the methodology. It, it is indeed a project grounded in oral history. Uh, and as Halima said, uh, I have a background working in the field back in the 80s and uh, early 90s. Um, and, and my intention was to, to build on my contacts from that time and then, you know, cascade through uh, um, uh, uh, from there on in. Um, I happen to have known Louise Casey, who became the home of Czar under, uh, under Blair, uh, since she was 18 through a mutual friend. Uh, and uh, Richard Cunningham, who, who ran the uh, Places Field, took over running the Places of Change programme as a specialist advisor to the MHCLG. Uh, was my deputy uh, when I ran the project in West London. So I started with them and built out. Uh, um, I would say, again, I've got to say my heartfelt thanks to, to, to everybody I've interviewed. I've noticed there's, there's a couple of you uh, uh, here today, uh, so I hope I don't misquote you. Uh, um, uh, because, uh, you know, the generosity of people and giving up their time to do the interviews uh, and, uh, and also recommending and giving me introductions to other people has been really you know, outstanding. Um, and again, it doesn't sound sycophantic. It's been a delight talking to, to you know, highly intelligent, deeply committed and well-informed people. Uh, so it's been a real pleasure. And there are, of course, questions there in oral history methodology uh, uh, about the, what, how, what that, that does. Uh, um, as a, There's a debate between insiders and outsiders. I think I almost qualify as an insider because I had experience in the field. And that may mean that I haven't challenged people enough uh, or I've been prone to agreeing with the people I've interviewed. And I also have to acknowledge that there's a, an evidential bias built into this in that uh, um, I tend to be talking to people who are still working in the field and therefore at least made some work in compact with New Labour's programme uh, at the time. Uh, um, I've tried to mitigate that by, by asking people if they could recommend somebody whose views they disagreed with uh, or, or took a contrary view, but I haven't been consistent about that and uh, I need to work on it. Um, and also, of course, some of the people, the dissenting views that I need to find will have left the sector and are therefore harder to get hold of. But as you can see, uh, my plan was uh, to, to speak to as many um, key decision makers, practitioners and people with lived experience of homelessness uh, um, uh, by interviewing over Zoom. And um, if it's all right to say in, in, in the face of a global health pandemic, uh, COVID and Zoom has been really helpful to the oral practitioner. Uh, in the space of three months, I've done some 60 interviews, which would have been logistically impossible uh, pre-COVID, but uh, silver linings. Um, uh, as you can see, um, 
you know, I, I sought to, to, to talk to people at every level in this process, um, in central government, uh, housing ministers, I say housing ministers, I've spoken to one, John Healy, who, who took over under Brown. Um, uh, it's worth saying there was a carousel of, uh, of housing ministers during New Labour, um, which has continued after the coalition and the Conservative government. There were 11, I believe, during that period. Uh, which may say something about the status of, of housing. I, when I read Chris Mullins, uh, you know, memoirs, and he's a, when he's appointed junior housing minister, he bemoans the fact that he's got this this insignificant and irritating task. Uh, uh, um, uh, I've interviewed from the Social Exclusion Unit, and I'll refer to that later. I spoke to um, uh, Moira Wallace. That was set up in the Blair government. Uh, uh, um, very in the very early days. I've had great access to the Rough Sleepers Unit, um, which was renamed the Homelessness Directorate in 2002. Um, I spoke to most of the people there, still a, still a few I, I want to speak to, but I uh, spoke to most. Uh, um, as the, the programme was uh, facilitated through local government, I've tried to speak to the local government housing officers and uh, heads of housing, and obviously uh, a great many people in the voluntary sector, in, in the homelessness sector. Um, but of course, the complexity of anybody who works in homelessness, you realise that, that, you know, where do you stop? Because actually, you, you, homelessness in many ways can be seen as a barometer of all the cracks and flaws in the welfare state. Uh, and uh, so I, I've tried to include and we're trying to include more people working in health, mental health, substance abuse, uh, the police and criminal justice system. And again, to try, and, and you know, methodologically, there are problems with this anyway, in trying to produce representation through this method of, of working. Uh, I've tried to do a mix of London based and national agencies, uh, and I've focused on uh, five uh, large metropolitan areas outside of uh, London, less than there, uh, um, and, and to try and bring in some more rural districts as well. And I've spoken to people you know, working in homelessness in Kent and in Devon. I mean, just to say the reason why this is important, uh, 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 if one looks at homelessness as being a feature of questions of housing supply, uh, the stories are quite different if you're dealing with London and the South East, or for example, if you're dealing with, uh, you know, Newcastle and the, the North East and Stoke, uh, Stephen Bell from, uh, uh, runs the remarkable agency Changing Lives that, 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 that covers the, the North East, uh, said that uh, uh, there wasn't really a housing problem in Newcastle, uh, a crisis, housing crisis in Newcastle, there was more of a crisis of hope, uh, uh, which I think is very interesting, and it does colour and alter the way in which um, homelessness manifests itself and homeless policies work across the country. Um, as you can see, um, the, the period I'm studying, uh, you know, covers devolution. Uh, Scotland went in quite a different direction post devolution in terms of its homeless policy. Uh, so therefore, I'm, I'm forced, I think, to leave just to try and make my goals realisable uh, to um, uh, to not deal with Northern Ireland, Wales, or, or Scotland. Uh, um, I'd be very interested in people's uh, views on that. Um, before I get into the meat of what I'm doing, I think homelessness has been bedevilled by by the problem of the definition of homelessness. Um, uh, uh, not until 2005 with Fianza, so that's a European body uh, of, of homeless uh, agencies, uh, home research, um, uh, did we get an agreed topology. And I was just going to quickly flick it up here. I hope this works. Um, yeah, this is the light version. Uh, and as you can see, this is an attempt to, you know, qualify what homelessness is, starting at the top with people actually living on the street uh, and working down to the bottom one, number six, which is rather clumsily terms uh, homeless people living temporary in conventional housing with family and friends. Uh, okay, I'll get rid of that. Um, go, go away. Oh, okay, there we go. Um, <laughs> Important to note here that without an agreed definition of homelessness uh, um, shapes many things about policy provision. Uh, um, even that definition I've shown up there with the hidden homeless at the bottom uh, is not necessarily a definition that, that everyone would hold to. It doesn't include uh, families living in over or people, individuals living over crowded accommodation or living in unsanitary, unsafe accommodation. Um, it doesn't include the much more complex question uh, about what constitutes a home. The term homelessness really is often uh, elided with houselessness. Home is a more complex question. Um, and I probably don't need to say to any of the audience that, that in Britain, the division between the statutory homeless, so those uh, considered to be in priority need, 
uh, under the Housing Act, originally 1977 has been uh, um, moderated, but remains substantially the same to this day. Uh, and those who are not considered in priority need or are uh, deemed vulnerable under the terms of the Act uh, and are therefore not, uh, um, uh, do not have a right uh, to housing. So these divisions that alter, and I'm on to the next slide, there are problems with, with, with the different definitions of homelessness. Um, and I think in a way I have to mention this because it's the, the most obvious critique of the work that I'm doing is by separating street homelessness or rough sleeping from the wider issue of homelessness. It has a number of manifestations. It clearly leads to a gross underestimation of the scale of the problem. Uh, and as many academics have pointed out, it allows government to separate a homelessness policy from a wider issue of housing supply. And, you know, candidly here, I am dealing primarily with the issue of homelessness policy and I'm dealing with street homelessness. I'm aware of these issues and I hope uh, that I take account of those as I, as I do my work. Um, perhaps even more significantly, it alters the public perception of the nature of homelessness. Most people assume that homelessness means rough sleeping. Uh, um, uh, and again, you know, the interaction between public perception and government policy is important. Um, uh, and finally, of course, it makes numeration. If you're working from different definitions of homelessness, your numbers are going to be profoundly different. And it also makes it very difficult uh, to change, uh, to measure change over time. Uh, and while I'm still doing the code before I talk about the research itself, I think it's important to say that any kind of policy program is predated on your understanding of the causes of homelessness. And this uh, debate between the relative importance of structural and individual causes of homelessness has run through the whole history oh, in academia and in provision. Uh, um, I suspect I don't need to spell this out to this audience, but, uh, but just to make it clear, structural causes of homelessness are principally economic, you know, unemployment, poverty, and perhaps most importantly, housing supply. And the idea that there are individual causes of homelessness, which actually has been the primary view really, really late in time, up until the late 1960s, it was homelessness was, was broadly seen. Uh, as being one as a consequence of individual pathology. And I put a few terms there. Uh, um, the first two risk factors and transmitted deprivation uh, are, are the relatively benign ones. Uh, modern scholarship, which sees this whole division uh, between structural and individual uh, uh, causes as a false binary, which actually concords with common sense, doesn't it? That, that uh, both factors are important in the generation of homelessness. Uh, but uh, modern conception says risk factors, things that make people more vulnerable to homelessness. Uh, you know, mental health, substance misuse, uh, um, uh, um, in youth homelessness, of course, the, the, the appalling proportion of, of young homeless people, and certainly the period that I'm talking about, who've been what we now call looked after children, people who've been in care, uh, um, is very much a factor. Interaction with the criminal justice system, and, and to a lesser extent, you know, people who've been in the armed forces may be more at risk of homelessness. Uh, um, uh, the term transmitted deprivation, which I put there, uh, has all sorts of, uh, uh, of associations and uh, pejorative uh, ways of viewing it. At its most benign, we're talking about adverse childhood experiences, the idea that, that uh, much homelessness is founded uh, uh, um, in, in experiences when people are young and when they're growing up, uh, um, uh, yeah, and, and trauma-based. Uh, you know, modern understandings of, of homelessness would, would certainly consider it, but of course it has a right-wing connotation to the idea of a feral underclass, uh, you know, passing down uh, their inadequacy from generation to generation. So that too has had a complicated history and in interpretations. Um, I mentioned inadequacy, but moral failure. Um, I mean, it seems extraordinary to me that this could ever be uh, the grounding for people's understanding of homelessness, but nonetheless, um, very strongly persistent uh, in public policy, in, in public perception, that the work shy and the lazy were homeless. I've also put down there um, uh, in a later bullet point, the, the association of homelessness with the conception of vagrancy. That's the envisaging of homeless people as, as you know, the tramp, the man of the road, the person who, who is voluntarily homeless, uh, um, which has dogged uh, uh, um, understanding of homelessness and an association with criminology, uh, criminality. Uh, um, uh, these views of homelessness and the causes of homelessness uh, uh, have enabled the state to, to disengage with, 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 with the issue. Uh, the phrase malign neglect 
I think, sums up uh, how homelessness has been treated. I mean, when the Welfare State is established, the 1948 National Assistance Act really ignores uh, the question of homelessness and provision of services has historically been left to the charitable sector. Uh, and this is an ancient history uh, in, in the period prior to the one I'm talking about. The Conservative government uh, made a number of pejorative statements about homeless people. Um, uh, and it being a matter of choice, uh, John Major had a particularly virulent rant against homelessness in, uh, um, uh, in his term of office. Um, and, and very often in youth homelessness, uh, uh, the term runaways was used a great deal. Uh, uh, and Nicholas Ridley, um, Secretary of State at the time, particularly suggested that that, uh, that that we shouldn't be helping the increasing numbers of young homeless people on the street because that would encourage them to leave home again, playing into this idea that it was a willed choice uh, uh, rather than uh, people as big uh, victims of circumstance or, or, or suffering from uh, questions of structural problems. And again, this concept of criminality is not historic. Uh, uh, the extraordinary persistence of the 1824 Vagrancy Act that effectively criminalises homelessness uh, uh, remains to this day, uh, um, uh, uh, despite you know, campaigns running since the 70s for its abolition. Uh, and I just put on the right there it, it is a, a piece of theatre done by Carlwood Citizens, who is a group of uh, people with lived experience of homelessness. Uh, uh, um, acting out, uh, actually acting out their anger uh, at, uh, um, at the persistence of the Vagrancy Act. Okay, so context. Um, homelessness under uh, the Thatcher and major administrations. Um, oh, by the way, I've, I, this is the only time I think, or only a few times that I use images of homeless people. I think there's an ethical question about, uh, about doing so. So I did question whether I, I should do this at all. Uh, but nonetheless, the two pictures on the right uh, um, um, uh, from the uh, uh, the bullring um, in, in London. Um, homelessness, and here, if you go back to my earlier comment about definitions, uh, there's been no agreed method of measuring homelessness. Uh, the definitions alter uh, up until the Blair administration. There was no agreed way of, uh, of or no consistent policy of how you measured street homelessness. So all statistics. Uh, um, are vague, possibly inaccurate, uh, uh, difficult to determine. So a lot of the time we're relying on widespread belief or visibility, which is a clear issue of, uh, of homelessness. But anyway, uh, without doubt, there's a rapid increase in the 1980s. And, and that's because of the high visibility uh, of homelessness, um, homeless people on, in streets of London uh, and in most major cities across the UK. Um, uh, when I began working in homelessness, every single shop doorway on the Strand and Charing Cross Road was occupied uh, and the homeless people had spread out right the way across London. I ran a project in West London in, in the leafy suburbs of Richmond uh, and there was a considerable presence of homeless people there. And I'm sure uh, those of you working at the time will, will, will reflect that in, in any city in the UK. Um, and again, almost extraordinary now that it ever seemed possible that in one of the wealthier cities in the world, we would have two, you know, cardboard cities, two shanty towns, you know, smack bang in the centre of the metropolis. Uh, the bull ring near Waterloo, uh, it was in a series of underpasses, that's where those pictures come from, uh, you know, just by the South Bank, had a population of some 200 to 250 people uh, living in appalling conditions. I, I, I ran soup runs into the bull ring at the time. I found it a frightening place. Um, there's, there's a degree of nostalgia about some of the communities that developed in the bull ring, which I have to say from my experience and from one or two people I've interviewed in the course of this is, uh, is quite bizarre because it was a, a violent and difficult place I found. And there was one in Lincoln's in Fields, you know, uh, in the square opposite these Georgian mansions where, where the, uh, um, uh, where, where many lawyers' offices are based, about 200 people there as well. Uh, that was a, a more convivial place, uh, more of a tent city than a cardboard city, uh, but uh, um, overrun by rats at various points, possibly due to a sewage break, but actually possibly due to the sheer number of soup runs that were servicing Lincoln's in fields and leaving behind sandwiches. Um, uh, appalling and astonishing. Uh, um, uh, I, I've put here the thing about changing demographics. I've done very little in the course of this presentation talking about the demographics of, of, of homeless people. It's complex, uh, multifaceted, and again, the statistics are poor, but uh, undeniably one feature of this period was a rapid increase in the number of young homeless people coming onto the streets. Um, uh, 
of the various people I talked to, um, Ian Brady, who is uh, um, who worked at Centrepoint at the time later, um, was the deputy uh, at the Rough Sleepers Unit, uh, said he had absolutely no doubt that it was direct consequence of changes in the benefit legislations for young people. It's the Social Security Act of 1986. They uh, um, cut completely benefit payments to the under 18s. Uh, um, and drastically reduced it for the under 25s. Uh, um, so um, that and rising costs of housing shut young people out of homelessness. So there you go, that's a snapshot in the way, vague but also profound. It was a, a extraordinary presence. I have to be careful not to ascribe too much uh, of the change to the Labour administration. Uh, the Conservatives, despite some of the pejorative statements made, did make steps to begin to address uh, the question of rough sleeping. Um, to say it was under public pressure, I think is almost certainly true, but nonetheless, they did take action. The action was significant. Um, they launched the Rough Sleepers Initiative in 1990, and there were three phases of it, uh, increasing amounts of money, and it was expanded outside uh, of, uh, of London to certain uh, towns and cities. Um, but it was prim its primary focus on central London. The, 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 the development was, was late uh, and uh, much less money was spent outside of uh, the capital. Uh, I'll put the numbers there. They're, they're substantial. Um, it funded largely emergency housing provision uh, via the voluntary sector um, and some, and uh, I put some, there was substantial uh, access. Certainly in London, there was a body, the clearinghouse set up, which had a number of properties available to move people on you know, from the hostels that were developed. And uh, additionally, they funded a homeless mental ill initiative, which put specialist workers uh, in outreach teams and, and within hostels. Um, it gets a lot of criticism in the academic literature as being um, largely about trying to render the issue invisible, about warehousing people and not really addressing the, the fundamental problems. Uh, I think some of that valuable uh, um, as a criticism, but it could equally apply uh, to, to Labour's programme, or perhaps. Um, again, within the vagaries of being able to estimate the numbers, uh, there's a belief that uh, it peaks around the mid-90s. Um, uh, and although that means that the rough superstition did reduce the, uh, the the base number, it was still extremely high when Labour came to power. Um, okay, Labour comes to power. Uh, I mean, interestingly, um, although Blair had made some you know, positive statements about um, uh, about the need to address homelessness. Um, He'd also made some very ambivalent statements too, and there was nothing in the Labour manifesto that necessarily uh, presumed that it would be a priority issue for Labour when they came to power. Um, however, um, one of the first actions Blair does is set up the Social Exclusion Unit um, in December 1997. So this is a cross-departmental body, and that's one of the things that's bedogged homeless policy forever. Whose responsibility is it? Is it, is it social services? If it's if your explanation of homelessness is an individual inadequacy or pathology, then it's got to be social services, uh, uh, or is it housing? Uh, um, uh, and there was a, a great deal of buck passing about whose responsibility it was, or what needed was coordination across. So uh, the setting up of a, of a body that acknowledged uh, uh, um, the cross-departmental um, nature of it um, was a tremendous step forward. Um, and of the first five priorities that the social exclusion unit looked at, one of them was street homelessness, and it produces a report uh, in July 1988. Uh, the picture on the right is of Moira Wallace, who was the director of the social exclusion unit, who, who I interviewed in the course of this. Uh, um, uh, other people have referred to her as being extraordinarily influential in, in the report's development. And I have to say the report is remarkable. Uh, uh, um, it's really thorough piece of research uh, and forms a grounding of a lot of what happens afterwards. Uh, when I was talking to her, I put there that she reported directly to the Prime Minister. Uh, she was quite happy to disabuse me that, that uh, that's not really how it works, uh, that uh, Prime Ministers have a great deal of commitments in their time. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, But clearly Blair was engaged and he was involved. He wrote the forward to the report um, and not one of those sign off forwards where they do a fancy signature and uh, you know it was a, a thoughtful uh, um, and actually in many ways controversial introduction and it's worth reading in itself uh, but she did point out that that uh, uh, she received broad support uh, across uh, cabinet ministers uh, felt that she had the strong backing of of, uh, of uh, new labor 
in the process of building this report. And she also pointed out that, that uh, uh, they did a great deal of research. They, they brought in expertise. They got out of Whitehall and asked a lot of people. Um, and you can see that if, if you get a chance to, to look at the report. Um, again, figures with all those codicils I said earlier uh, suggest that there were 2,400 people. I mean, that's an awful lot of people living on the streets in London uh, and perhaps you know, 10,000 more um, uh, sleeping rough across the rest of the UK. Right, I think I'll take a pause here. Uh, oh no, I'll go straight into what Labour does. So, um, 1999, the, rough, the Social Exclusion Unit leads to the setting up of a rough sleepers unit. It set a target of reducing rough sleeping by two thirds by April 2002. And I think in all honesty, when this target was set, there was a, an assumption that this would be extraordinarily difficult to achieve. And yet the target was achieved ahead of schedule uh, by November, November 2001. And the graph you know, shows this very rapid decline in the early years and then a slowing in the rate of decline. Um, and agencies argue that this was because the people that were left were people with the really entrenched street homes who's been on the streets a long time with high levels of support needs. Uh, but the numbers continued to climb into 2010 uh, when street homelessness at, at the lowest level on record um, and homelessness, not entirely, but largely ceases to be a visible problem. Um, the statistics here uh, were measured on the basis of single night street counts. Uh, so the voluntary sector in conjunction with local authorities in every region of the country uh, would go out on one particular night of the year and count the number of people sleeping rough in their district. You can imagine without having to be an expert that there are problems with this. Uh, would you find all the people who were there? Um, uh, what about areas where there wasn't any expertise uh, uh, to, to be able to locate those people? Um, it only gives you a snapshot of homelessness. It doesn't accommodate the flux and flow of people coming in out of homelessness. Uh, it's flawed. Uh, and again, there were some criticisms which I'll come to later about whether the count was done you know, in an honest and uh, uh, um, method. I think the criticism on the margin uh, um, but at least it creates a consistent means of measuring for the very first time. Uh, and it does seem that most agencies and most people I've spoken to say that this produces in crude a broad indication of what happened. So if I pause there, that's remarkable. That's a remarkable reduction in street homelessness. And my first thought here is something really, I mean, I'm a simplistic historian, something happened. It seems really important. <laughs> we should be looking at it. And we should be looking at it because after 2010, homelessness has risen by 169%. You know, prior to, to, to COVID and lockdown, we were returning to levels of homelessness uh, of the late 1980s. So, hence the framing of the whole question. Yeah. Are we looking here at an extraordinary social policy triumph? The lessons and legacy of we have lost due to errors, mistakes, judgments following 2010? Or were there flaws in the programme itself that meant that it collapsed under its own contradictions, perhaps, uh, uh, which is why we see this change? And, and, and this seems vital to me uh, to, to look into and understand. Oh, this is this is my first historian's. Um, I did say forgotten social policy, and it strikes me as extraordinarily intriguing. Not only has this event happened, but it's been com almost completely forgotten. Um, it, it, general histories of the periods I mentioned in the talk. Um, even if you look at scholarly accounts that are measuring labor, labor's performance in office, it's a footnote. Uh, it, it's it's you know it's there in the sort of index at the back. Um, and it, most remarkably still, it, it's kind of unmentioned in the memoirs of the key architects of the new Labour programme. I put Blair, Brown, uh, uh, you know, Prescott Mandelson up there, uh, but, but uh, um, and even Nick Rainsford, uh, you know, housing minister, a man passionately committed to housing in his work, Substance Not Spin, talks quite a lot about family homelessness, but there's half a page on street homelessness. Um, and I've quoted there uh, from Tony B. and Walker's assessment of, uh, of the Labour government, 
uh, the verdict, did Labour change Britain, where they say, you know, that Labour's success in clearing the nighttime streets of their Dickensian cargo was a quick alleviation of one of the easier symptoms of Thatcher's legacy. I mean, I think the first sentence could do with some unpicking in itself, but it's the second one uh, that really gets my ire. You know, what? <laughs> easier legacy of Thatcher? Uh, Thatcher? You know, homelessness has, has been an issue probably in every urban society in history, you know, in British history, uh, you know, Elizabethan fears of vagabonds and sturdy beggars, you know, was a major issue. The vagrancy act itself was passed off the, the Napoleonic Wars. Um, anybody who's read Orwell will be aware uh, that, you know, interwar vagrancy uh, was a major issue, uh, you know, with the incarceration of people in, in the casual wards, tramping from spike to spike under the poor law, uh, and numbers have been rising from the 1960s. So this idea that it was an easy legacy that could be resolved seems to me to be a misreading of history uh, to an extraordinary scale. However, um, you know, when I was doing this, in the first year of my research on having said here is this complex social problem that states have struggled with, and maybe you know here we are looking at you know the the strongest and, and most thought through intervention uh, you know ever undertaken under New Labour, uh, and then on twenty sixth of March, um, Luke Hall, Minister for Housing and Homelessness, issues the Everyone In Directive. Yeah, all homeless people to be housed by the end of the week. The state will provide sufficient funds to local authorities to ensure this takes place. I think he issued it on a Thursday. Uh, and within an extraordinarily short period of time, 15,000 people uh, 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 found accommodation. You know, and, and I reflected on this thinking, well, is this really in the end? Homelessness has always been a matter of political will. If you actually just put the money in, you know, make a commitment to do so, uh, uh, the issue, you know, can be, as so often people have talked about, ending homelessness forever. Now, clearly, uh, um, that accommodation was provided in students' uh, accommodation or, or in uh, hotels. It, it wasn't a program that fully incorporated, uh, uh, you know, the support needs of those individuals to help them maintain those tenancies. Uh, and, you know, scandalously, we're in the second lockdown and there has been no second everyone in directive. So... Nonetheless. Okay. Um, and again, um, people, social policy experts and work in the field, indulge me here. This is my historian thinking, but I do think that if you're going to understand what happened, we do need to think about the motivation for, for Labour undertaking it. And I do think that the way we frame that really depends on how we view the new Labour administration. And I put up here what is perhaps a caricature, but it's also a widely representative view of how people see new Labour. Um, fundamentally, as Thatcherism light, uh, Mandelson rather famously talked about being unconcerned about inequality, it's when it's a market, and actually what it's really concerned about is winning elections, not delivering social change. Uh, it's about image, it's all substance, all spin and no substance. Uh, and I put there um, Simon Jenkins's Thatcher and Sons, but I could equally put up Andrew Rawnsley's Servants of the People, popular accounts of New Labour that present the government in these frame of reference. Now, if you view the Labour government in these terms, then you can interpret their actions in homelessness in a particular way, um, in ways that, that uh, accord with the, the academic conception of revanchist theory. Now, this is an assumption that the reaction of the state in its modern form, you know, driven by neoliberalism, you know, if you should term that, is fundamentally punitive. It punishes the homeless for their moral lapses uh, and that cities are refashioned to willfully marginalise the visible poor. Now, these conceptions came out largely of American studies, uh, so there's always a question about how much you can transpose that um, uh, internationally. Um, uh, but the idea that you clear districts, you sanitise areas, you ghettoise the homeless and homeless services in different ways, you drive people off the streets. There are things, if you take this interpretation of labour, uh, that can look like that. You know, the first parts of the um, Rough Sleepers Units programme uh, um, were focused on emergency accommodation. So 
where they just warehouse the homeless people in hostels rather than really addressing the fundamental issues of affording affordable housing supply. Um, you want to stop homeless people being visible, you want to close down those soup runs. I mean, soup runs are a highly visible uh, aspect of the provision of services to homeless people. They, you know, gather large crowds. Uh, they take place on the on the streets uh, um, in, in areas which cause congregations of homeless people to attract those services. You want to close them down and invest in day centres. Day centres provide the same service, but it's invisible now. You can't see it. Now, Labour undeniably did this, uh, very controversially attempted to rationalise the soup runs that were going into central London uh, um, and did put a lot of money into day centres. Um, you can view that as being trying to render the, 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 the visible poor, the, the poor invisible, or, or you can see that as a rational policy response. Uh, um, I'll come back to it later. Um, I'd be interested in other people's interpretations. Um, also, of course, uh, you can remove the, the homeless people in the streets by designing out problematic street activities, and Labour does do these things. Um, unfairly, in the top right, I, I put a picture of the kind of street architecture that's introduced for us sleeping. That's for Tesco's in Regent Street. That's not the Labour government's plan, uh, but it's illustrative, I think. Um, they also did. I'm sorry, my internet's gone unstable. I hope I'm still here. Uh, Haliba, can you nod if I'm, I'm still here? Good. Um, they also created, uh, uh, it's using the um, uh, Criminal Justice Act to create uh, designated public place orders. So they would be areas where, um, where street drinking was uh, um, an offence uh, um, and created zones which therefore the police had the powers to drive people who were drinking on the streets or begging on the streets, you know, out of those areas. They did do these things. Uh, they made begging a recordable offence for the first time. They issued ASBOs. Um, I'll come back to the later, not as many ASBOs as you would think, uh, but they did issue ASBOs uh, again to discourage uh, street behaviour. Um, the bottom right is a picture of an ASBO served on a homeless person. And although I'm afraid the, it's too small for you to see, that is essentially the area of central London, the whole of central London, which this individual uh, was no longer allowed to enter. Um, they also um, discourage public from giving money directly to homeless people, the diverted giving schemes, which were hugely controversial, where uh, Louise Casey uh, um, encouraged people not uh, to give money directly to homeless people, but to give it to the agencies uh, themselves under the Change a Life campaign. Um, all those things interpreting in different ways but as i said if you go if your view is that the labor party is fundamentally about spin about winning elections about presentation uh, uh perhaps uh you can view the whole of the policies that they enact in that framework in opposition to that it's essentially taking labor party seriously you, you're accepting the sincerity of what it said it intended to do uh, that it was genuinely concerned with social exclusion, that evidentially it invested significant resources in addressing street homelessness. Uh, and it does it actually in a manner uh, that is entirely consistent uh, with that most derided of ideologies, uh, the third way. Uh, um, I feel there's a there's a there's a there's a different story here, which perhaps is what you want me to talk about about the way in which uh, the the model of their working practices is is, is almost a, a paradigm for for third way ideology. A bit of I skirt through it quickly. This is the government it isn't necessarily the provider. This is the what works matters, not who provides it. It acts as an enabler. Uh, um, uh, it forms compacts uh, with the voluntary sector, uh, which is exactly the way in which they delivered the program. It involves the modernisation of public service delivery, and we'll look at the way in which there was indeed modernisation, use of outside expertise, uh, the most you know divided, but nonetheless the evidence of uh, evidence-based policy making. I think you can certainly argue that that's from the social exclusion unit's report on the, that's there in this process. Modern management techniques and an emphasis on measurable outcomes. And that even those aspects that could be interpreted through the other lens as a punitive uh, would be seen from a third way perspective as being one of, uh, of the principle of rights and responsibility. We will offer services, uh, we will create the possibilities for change, but you must take advantage of them and you, you, will, you must behave in certain way. So, frameworks established, what does Labour do? Uh, well, the Rough Sleepers Unit is set up. Uh, um, this is a government quango, essentially, based in Whitehall. 
uh, again reporting directly to the PM. And, and here I'll put Louise Casey, uh, who became the homelessness czar um, at this time, uh, front and center, that's the picture on the top right. Um, uh, there's more truth about directly reporting to the PM. Um, uh, Louise, um, depending on your perspective on Louise, uh, uh, either um, incompetitive uh, or, or, uh, or, or fearless, uh, depending how you view it, certainly had great access to the Prime Minister and it kept this issue very close uh, to Labour's interest. Uh, she also had big presence in the press, uh, both controversial and positive, uh, uh, so that it gave a very high profile to the issue of dressing rough sleeping. Um, expertise was brought in. I mean, Louise herself had been the deputy director of Shelter, Ian Brady, her deputy, uh, had, had come from Centrepoint, uh, and there's, a, uh, there's a, a fusion right the way through uh, the, the, the period of the operation of the uh, rough sleepers unit, renamed the homeless director after 2002, uh, um, Rebecca Pritchard, uh, Richard Cunningham, uh, 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 Matt Potts, you know, the, the, most of the staff and many of these I've interviewed uh, uh, had flowed backwards and forwards. Tom Priest uh, had, had periods uh, yeah, as specialist advisors. Um, this was a genuine attempt to incorporate uh, um, expertise from the sector. And the money was big. Uh, I put the first budgets there, 134 million, and it grows from there. Uh, and it's a national uh, programme. Uh, covering 113 towns and cities across the UK in the way that the Rough Sleepers Initiative wasn't. Uh, the bottom right is a picture of Jeremy Swain. And I put him up here because he was saying uh, at the time there was, there was a suspicion in the voluntary sector about, uh, uh, about the role of the state uh, in engaging in the process. Uh, and, uh, and, and he said to me, uh, I, know, I should be quoting exactly, but I'm possibly not. Uh, but he said, what have we won? What have we asked for? We wanted a cross party departmental body that, that, that you know that you know that dealt with the issues of homelessness we wanted it led by the sector we wanted it to engage with our expertise we wanted it to be grounded in research and delivered through the voluntary sector what are we complaining about we got everything we asked for again i'd be very interested i know some of you watching may uh, uh, may have different views but but nonetheless uh, I, jeremy's perspective oh sorry jeremy swain is the ceo or was the ceo of one of the biggest homeless agencies um ten reach probably it's probably about five five minutes or so that's okay oh my god uh, right i'm gonna have to speed up uh, and i thought i was racing through um and i've already started anyway look um um management uh um how was it done uh, they got control of a single budget um uh, and it was very hands-on. Uh, I'll put John Kurt at the top there, top right. Uh, um, uh, he's one of many people who told me stories of, you know, Louise Casey turning up at midnight in one of the rolling shelters that he ran you know, with, a, with someone demanding that they give them a bed. Uh, and the whole of that team, you know, went out on street counts. And uh, it was a remarkably interesting idea that Whitehall civil servants, you know, would have such a proactive you know, action as they did. Um, it introduced competitive tendering. And again, this is interpretive in numbers of different ways. Uh, certainly, uh, um, I put these on the CAT teams, that's the community, uh, the contact and assessment teams, the outreach teams. Previously in central London, the, every, uh, many homeless organizations had their own outreach teams, uh, uh, all covering the same area. So if you were sleeping on the streets, you'd be woke three or four times in the course of the night by a different body. So, so, uh, so um, uh, the agency then had to bid and were granted specific areas to work in. Um, the funding was conditional on certain ways of working uh, and it was measured by specific targets which had to be recorded, uh, uh, output had to be recorded. In order to renew your contracts, you had to be making progress towards achieving a set targets. Now, I thought, and this is hugely controversial in the whole of Labour's method of working with obsessive numbers of targets, that I might come across, uh, um, uh, you know, a great deal of resistance to this. And, and actually, some of the workers said that these were bureaucratic. There was a great many forms to do it, reduced the amount of time they had with clients. But every agency, uh, pretty much any agency worker I've spoken to, uh, um, CEOs and um, directors he said well we're getting large numbers of public money of course we have to be accountable for what we do uh, and that actually by being accountable force people to focus on real determination for rehabilitation and resettlement rather than just spending the money uh, without thinking of the consequences of what they were doing uh, i mustn't hurry too much and i'm sorry that i've taken too long um the 
effect on the voluntary sector um, has been viewed in pejorative terms. And, and Cloak made a number of arguments, all of which I think are valid, that it, it created competitive rather than collaborative relationships. I think that's true. But many people I've spoken to said uh, that, that they no longer shared information necessarily because they were bidding against each other. It created insider and outsider organisations, that many faith groups became outsider organisations. Although, of course, many of the groups that got the money had their origins as, as faith groups. Uh, tendency to make larger agencies grow. I think this is true, uh, uh, often by takeover or merger, really, but, but mergers are often takeovers. And that lots of smaller and perhaps more locally responsive groups, you know, were fell by the wayside and that volunteering declined. I think all these things are true, but I think they're all nuanced. Uh, um, uh, the volunteering uh, and some of the more amateurish groups who perhaps didn't have a focus on really addressing change uh, um, lost out. And certainly that's the perspective of many of the people I've interviewed. Um, uh, Cloak argues that it uh, um, reduced the uh, dependence on government funding, reduced the capacity for the critical voice of the industry, which seemed logical. Uh, but I put a picture of Charles Fraser there, the, uh, uh, the CEO of St. Mungo's, uh, and somebody said to me in the course of my interview, what, reduce the critical voice? Have you met Charles Fraser? Uh, uh, and uh, uh, no one's going to shut him up. Uh, and I think uh, I, I, told him I met Charles, he's absolutely charming, uh, 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 but nonetheless, clearly forthright and not afraid of expressing his views. Um, the bottom there perhaps is a more important one that uh, this, this deprives of state funding reduced the independence. I'm struggling to hit time, I'm really sorry. Um, First phase then, you're going to count the homeless people and you're going to target emergency accommodation. This is what took place. Uh, I've mentioned the single night counts and I hope some of the doubts about uh, the uh, efficacy and accuracy about them. Uh, there I think was, uh, I have some manipulation of the statistics for, for all sorts of reasons, but I think it's only on the margins. Uh, the Simon community, who are the definition of outsider organisation, uh, part of Wallace Clifford's view when he set up the Simons was that uh, uh, and they would never take money from the state, uh, and they claimed much higher figures for, for numbers of rough sleepers, uh, although this doesn't accord with any of the people I've spoken to. I think one of the other important points here is this idea of identifying and targeting entrenched rough sleepers. I put a picture of Bill Tidman there, the current CEO of Tensrich Bombway, and he pointed out that back in uh, when he first was working in it, there was a tendency for agencies to work with the, with the kind of newly homeless or the sofa surfing, the people with very low support needs, because actually they were easier to work with and easier to resettle. And one thing that the RSU did is that it forced them to, to focus on those people who were long-term rough sleepers, you know, identified by the CAT teams and addressed in that way. I'll have to skip some bits here. Um, and here I enter possibly the most controversial uh, aspect of what Labour did, uh, which is conceptions of, uh, of assertive outreach and coercion and control. Now, assertive outreach um, essentially is a, a method of working whereby um, you, you do wake up people on the street. You're not just doing palliative care, handing out a cigarette, having a chat, that you're always working to try and encourage people to come off the streets. How you work, um, uh, RSU funded you know, special services alongside us, so mental health and substance abuse workers coming along, but also joint working with the police. And the pictures I put up there uh, 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 will attempt to give a range of this. Uh, at the top right is uh, Kevin uh, Flevin, a substance misuse outreach worker at the time with one of the CAT teams, one now runs his own consultancy. Uh, um, uh, and uh, he said, we, uh, we happen to, yeah, he comes from the same part of London, he went to the same school, but I didn't know him. He said, oh, you never recognize Recognised me back then, you know, I had dreadlocks and camouflage, you know, outfits. Uh, you know, he said, I'm, a, I'm a fundamentally a communist. Uh, uh, you'd have thought he'd have been more sceptical about assertive outreach, but actually he believed that it was a vital tool and it was the correct way of working and that having a combination of carrot and stick was absolutely necessary to do so. Uh, the picture in the centre is Tom Priest, who was one of the evangelists for this approach. He did it both with the uh, 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 socially... Uh, the, within the Rust Sleepers Unit and, and then as uh, in Camden Council. But I also put a picture of Dave Musker there. Um, I tracked down Dave Musker, who's in the Gulf now. He runs um, uh, international cricket security. But at the time, uh, he was a chief superintendent in Brixton, responsible for clearing the ball ring, and then it worked again in Croydon. Uh, and he's the most eminently quotable man. Because uh, um, uh, I was saying to him, well, you know, how did working with the police and with, you know, the outreach teams, you've got Kevin Clemmer with his dreadlocks. And he said, well... <laughs> Undeniably, you know, many of the homeless workers, you know, uh, felt that they weren't so keen to work with the jack-booted Nazi police. And likewise, many of his police officers were unsure whether they had any commonality with the quiche-eating, sandal-wearing guardian readers of the homeless sector. 
Uh, but he was absolutely adamant that they didn't have to agree with each other, that it was a learning process for both parties and that the role the police played both in uh, removing the uh, uh, you know, violence and exploitative people who were you know, working on the street, uh, um, but also in, in, in working alongside was profoundly important. Um, I can't now, because I've spent too much time on other things, talk about the ways in which the academic literature has condemned this, but I've just quoted Suzanne, I've got to reference to Suzanne Patrick, the sort of doyenne of homeless researchers. She did work both in 2005 and in 2010 uh, uh, on this issue of coercion control. And I think what's interesting about it is our 05 work is very suspicious about this, concerned that this was you know, invasions of, uh, of privacy and, and of civil rights. Uh, her 2010 piece actually uh, it, is much more nuanced um, and recognises the fact that actually many homeless people were themselves subjects of exploitative people and that, that, that often uh, uh, quietly and in reflection they, they, uh, uh, um, they acknowledge that this was, you know, the, this was necessary and was protective of them. Uh, Dave Musker said the same things in very similar ways and no one said to his face, thank you for removing that. That guy was taxing me or bullying me on the streets. Well, they might mention it quietly later on. Uh, I have got a dissenting voice. There's Alistair Murray at the bottom. Uh, um, uh, very hostile to the closing down of soup. I'm very hostile to this approach. Uh, felt that it was an entirely wrong direction. Uh, he's the head of, was the CEO of uh, Housing Justice at the time. Oh, uh, I'm rushing now to try and keep going. Um, uh, in working practice in specialist services, uh, again, so much on here that I'd like to talk about. Um, there are questions uh, uh, about, um, and it's important to be clear that the developments in working practice weren't driven entirely by the Russ Lieber's unit or the central government. These are evolving organically from best practice within homeless agencies. Uh, some of the pictures are up there, they're Don Wood from Bristol, uh, uh, Stephen Bell there again from Changing Lives. As uh, Stephen Bell said to me that when, you know, when the money started coming, it was like a coiled spring when introduced these improved ways of working. You know, they actually focused on you know, the whole of the individual to you know, really work on rehabilitation and training. Don Wood talked about the, the amateurishness of the, of the sector before this period began and, and, and the old school ways of working. Um, I put there about user empowerment. User empowerment was almost completely absent. Now this partly driven. It's there in, in, in the, uh, the Homeless Act of 2002 that the, the, the local authorities had to consult service users. It was there in any bids that service users had to be uh, um, uh, consulted. It's really the beginning of the understanding that the voices and opinions of people with lived experience you know, had to be central to it. I'll put a picture of John Hamblin down in Devon and Athol Howe who ran uh, um, uh, the Carpet Citizens and they began and, and, and Groundswell. Uh, uh, you know, you know, you know, adamant that not the local, the the the, the Labour's program created this, but that it facilitated its development. Make some reference to the importance of specialist teams. There are criticisms, and the criticisms are that it created an undue bureaucratic system, and that it tended this target setting and measurement tended to create deficit interviewing, interviewing forms where you're concentrating on the, the problems of the person. So you meet someone for the first time uh, and you'll say, you know, oh, yeah, well, tell me about your mental health problems. Tell me about your terrible childhood. And, and instead of looking at the whole person uh, and, uh, and uh, Pat McArdle from the Mayday Trust, they're very adamant that this is kind of poisoned in the way in which uh, we work with homeless people to this present day has created a built-in way of working of homeless agencies that's inappropriate and counterproductive. Charging on, uh, when I was talking to people, what was generally considered to be one of the two most important uh, developments is the Homelessness Act of 2002. Uh, so this is not, a, it, it did increase the, the, the categories of impriority need, but most importantly, it's encouraged, it, it obliged local authorities to produce homelessness prevention strategies. Uh, um, uh, Sheila Spencer in the middle there said that maybe who did the reviews of the, the homeless strategies across the country uh, said that many people, uh, simply many local authorities simply hadn't taken any account of it at all before they were legally obliged to do so, uh, they did not. Um, what it does do is it gave the local authorities central role in the commissioning of services. Uh, and uh, Charles Fraser bemoaned the fact that as a, a London agency working across the London wide problem, he now had to deal individually with 37 London boroughs. Uh, uh, the, um, um, Dave Barrett at the bottom there, who uh, see a porch light over in Ken, uh, has to do with two tier districts where housing and social services are separated across the two components, which created you know menus with it. 
nonetheless. Uh, uh, and Jean, I think you're in the in, in the audience. So a picture of you uh, there at the right hand side. I could have chosen any one of these slides. The other, perhaps most profound and important development, was the supporting people funding. Uh, introduced in April 2003, huge sums of money, and in many ways, uh, this this is a uh, th th it was a means of transferring the support element of housing benefit into you know, a different model. But agencies working with local authorities maximised the amount of money to the shock and horror of the Treasury that the bill came in at 1.8 billion. That's an extraordinary commitment, uh, uh, um, uh, but enabled if not exactly needs led funding rather than resource-led funding because it's patchy it depended on what existing provision was there beforehand uh, but enormous sums of money designed to enable people to come off the streets and stay off the streets and it was ring fenced it could only be spent on those services and that ring fencing and the amount of money enabled the, the second phase of the rust leaders unit program to be sustained uh, Criticism. I'll put Charles up there again. He hated it because it meant that he had to deal with local authorities as commissioners, rather than getting funding directly. And many people commented that the problem is that the local authorities didn't necessarily have the expertise, and that therefore would make decisions about how services should be delivered, rather than what the outcome should be. Uh, uh, and indeed, the same critic uh, from Cloak that uh, the voluntary sector uh, was therefore dependent on state funding and lost its autonomy. Hostile improvement. And again, I would have talked for ages about this. I'll have to do another lecture another time if people are willing. Uh, uh, um, and I attempted along the bottom there, and I've crammed in the slides to say that the provision of homelessness services and hostel services in particular uh, was patchy at best. Uh, some were uh, had moved to smaller, more you know, responsive, uh, but many were characterised by you know dormitory accommodation, inappropriate buildings, you know, a forbidding outlook. And, and I put on the bottom the place that I worked when I first started homelessness, uh, a Bondway night shelter in Vauxhall, uh, and I couldn't get a picture of inside the dormitory, but but vast dormitories, you know, divided by partitions, you know, in a big old you know, had been a route in the house, big old warehouse. In contrast. Uh, um, uh, um, and the, the Labour government funded the Places for Change programme, and the Places for Change programme had a profound impact on the physical structure of many hostels of the country. On the left, I've chosen Endell Street, which is a Mungo's project, uh, and there are two shots of the interior there, and you can see the difference. And this is the idea that if you're really going to help people rehabilitate change, they're going to need to exist in a space uh, uh, that is conducive to that. Um, and um, uh, this this idea is not just in the places of change program that it's about the physical fabric of building it's about also the way in which you work with human beings and i've put pictures of uh, robin johnson and, and nick mcguire there who really uh, towards the end of this period have formulated the conception of psychologically informed spaces although robin was very anxious to point out to me uh, that uh, actually what he was doing was describing best practice that had already developed uh, within uh, the industry substantial funds substantial change in the physical fabric Nearly there, Halima. I'm apologies for overrunning. Uh, limitations and the obvious critique of uh, the Labour's programme is that the question of move on accommodation, many hostels silted up. There simply wasn't enough accommodation for people to move on to, but perhaps it's the rest in the housing record of the Labour government. Uh, and John Healy's on the left there. He uh, quite candidly said to me that they made a mistake. They 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 should have invested much earlier on the provision of uh, of, uh, of either council housing or, or through the housing association investment fund to have built more properties. You know, Labour did not address the structural issues of housing. Uh, I put in brackets at the bottom that they counter argue that they did try and address social exclusion. Uh, by other things beyond homelessness policy uh, um, to ensure that people could access, you know, tax, working families, tax credit, minimum wage, and so forth. Um, again, I know I've got a lot of housing experts out there. I'll be very interested to, to hear your perspectives. Uh, so tentative conclusions have finally got there. Uh, New Labour was sincere about addressing social exclusion. I, 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 certainly in homelessness, there's a significant intervention. They put unprecedented funding and they had a logically coherent programme. I think the criticisms of the programme, and this is from the voices of all the people I've spoken to so far, we acknowledge some of them on the margins. Perhaps you know, uh, Pat McArdle was the, the, the strongest criti critic, uh, but most considered to be marginal compared to the core achievements, although it didn't address the fundamental structures of housing supply. And I threw, throw in one last slide. It, it, it's worth saying, you know, what's the legacy? Uh, why is it risen so rapidly? Um, 
I think that there's a fundamental issue about visibility and homelessness. I think as an issue, it rises to the public forefront, it rises to policy when it is in large numbers. Uh, when the numbers decline, we forget it. Um, uh, and the only analogy I could think of this in terms of is litter. Uh, you know, if the, if the, the parks are covered in litter, uh, um, uh, you know, the people are writing to the council, moaning in the council chamber, writing to the local press. Uh, if there's no litter, you know, nobody you know, talks about it anymore. And I think there's a, a real correlation between visibility as a social problem in a way that affects no other social problems. You, know, you can you know, treat prisoners really badly or completely negate the learned estate, but only those directly involved are aware. Homelessness is played out visibly on the streets and its relevance and its significance is considered proportionate to that. Uh, for everybody I spoke to, there's a genuine belief that the ending of the ring fencing, which was done by the Labour government actually after the crash of 2008, it meant that the money that had been ring fenced for supporting people disappeared. And Suzanne Fitzpatrick recently wrote a piece about localism, saying that this is the problem, uh, that local authorities, unsqueezed by austerity, just move the money out of those services. Uh, they move those monies out because, you know, homeless people are not the first priority and when they're being reduced to their core responsibilities, they repurpose that money. So the combination of localism and austerity uh, led to an end. But of course, as I said right at the beginning, homelessness is a barometer uh, of the cracks in the welfare state. So if you if you cut across the board, uh, um, more vulnerable people become homeless. And of course, the supply of affordable housing has not been addressed. Look, apologies for overrunning. Uh, um, just to say at the end, if you're interested in hearing more, please get in touch. Uh, um, I, I'm really happy to send people the list of the people I've spoken to before, or tell me who I should be talking to. Uh, and if anybody has uh, you know, had lived experience or worked in homes in that period, please let me know. I'd love to talk to you.